welcome to the channel. Here, I share scareful stories. Stories to make you scared, make you think, make you wonder, and maybe, just maybe, make you a little more careful. Today's story is one of the weirdest I've seen in the past few years. If you're as intrigued by stories like this one as I am, please like the video, leave a comment down below letting me know what you think, or suggestions for more seriously scareful stories, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Okay, I know you can only subscribe once, but do that, please. We're on our way to 100, which is so small time as almost not worth mentioning, but to me, it will be a really big deal. And now, the scareful story of a hot tub, a murdered professor, and two naked men. Marianne Shackley was 43 years old on May 11, 2019. As a professor of entomology at the University of Georgia, summer break was on the horizon, and with Mother's Day being the next day, Marianne may have had plans to spend some time with her two children that weekend. She'd been dating Marcus Allen Lillard for about a year and a half, and the two had made plans to see each other that day and hopefully find a friend with a pool who would let them do some swimming. Marcus was 41 years old at the time and a former car salesman. He was also serving a sentence of felony probation stemming from drug charges a year prior. He was friends with Clark Heindel, and guess what Clark had at his house? That's right, a pool. Clark, a 69-year-old former clinical psychologist, operated the Good Karma Yoga Studio. Marianne and Marcus headed over to Clark's home, and the next thing we know for certain is that at 1.06 a.m. on March 12, 2019, a call came into 911 that a woman had drowned. That woman was Marianne. Police who arrived on the scene would later say that it was one of the strangest scenes they've ever seen. Marcus, Clark, and Marianne were all naked, with Marianne lying on the pool deck bleeding profusely from a head injury. She was unresponsive and had no pulse. Shortly after EMS arrived, she was declared dead. At this point, the police called in a detective and separated Marcus and Clark so they could talk to them separately to try and figure out what had happened that night. Marcus was placed in the back of a squad car and Clark was allowed to sit on the porch of his home. Clark told police that he had been swimming in the pool while Marianne was in the hot tub and Marcus went into the woods to find firewood. When Marcus came back, he found Marianne unconscious. The two men pulled her out of the hot tub and began doing CPR. She appeared to start breathing, so they thought she would come around, so they waited around 45 minutes to call 911. Marcus's story would turn out to be similar in some ways and very different in others. Returning to the pool deck, officers found beer cans and bottles, but no other drugs. They also found a pair of glasses and a woman's bracelet, both of which had blood spots close to them. There was also blood-soaked grass near the pool deck. Deputies returned to the porch to talk more with Clark, only to find the porch empty. Knocking on the door, they received no answer and instead heard a loud but muffled noise, which caused them to make their way into the house. Upstairs, they found Clark deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That only left Marcus to tell us what happened that night. Marcus was interviewed four times. The first two times he told rather similar stories, but at some point his story began to shift. According to him, he and Marianne arrived at Clark's home around 7 p.m. Clark and Marcus spent some time playing the bongos and an accordion. When the music finished, Marcus and Marianne stripped off their clothes and jumped into the pool. He says that they kissed a bit, but didn't do anything more physical than that. After swimming for a while, Marcus decided to hop out of the pool and head into the woods, naked, to collect firewood. I don't know about you, but even if you're the kind of person person to swim naked, it's a rare person who's willing to walk around in the woods totally naked searching for firewood. Making this part of the story even stranger was that it had rained quite a bit earlier in the day, so finding dry wood would have been highly unlikely. Investigators also noted that there was a pile of cut firewood near a fire pit by the pool deck. Did Marcus just not realize there was already firewood? Highly doubtful. In the first version of his story, Marcus said he spent about 15 minutes in the woods. Later, that would change. Marcus said that upon emerging from the woods, he found Marianne passed out in the hot tub. He claims to have pulled her out, dropping her into the deep end of the pool, hoping that would shock her into waking up. At some point in doing this, he says she sustained a head wound that began bleeding. He jumped into the pool as well and swam her to the shallow end, pulling her out and onto the pool deck. He and Clark then began trying to resuscitate her. Neither
Neither being trained in proper CPR technique, you'd think that a call to 911 would have occurred at this point, but it didn't. Some reports say that the two men thought Marianne was faintly breathing, and so they were waiting for her to recover. Clark went into the house and prepared some hallucinogenic tea, which they then poured down Marianne's throat. Clark also shook a hydrangea branch over her body, thinking it might help her come to. Really, guys? My reaction to all this is a huge, what the actual F is going on? You have time to brew up some tea and find hydrangea branches, but no time to call 911. Oh, and no time to pull on a pair of pants, because remember that when police do finally arrive, Marcus and Clark are both still naked. I did find one source that stated that Clark actually did have some swim trunks and a t-shirt on when the police arrived, so there's some variance in the reports on this. Most of the stories that were reported the next day say that all three of the people on the scene were naked when the police arrived. When these attempts at reviving Marianne didn't work, they finally began performing CPR. After two long hours, the men called 911. Neither man had told the police that they had waited two hours to make the call. We only know that they did because are you sitting down for this next part? Police found text messages on Marcus's phone from earlier in the evening where he was asking friends for help and asking if anyone knew how to perform CPR. They also found searches he had done asking Google how to bring someone back to life. Here's a suggestion. Anytime you find yourself in need of Googling how to bring someone back to life, call 911. Marcus was arrested and charged with felony murder, involuntary manslaughter, reckless conduct, and concealing the death of another. In the days following the incident, blood tests came back showing Marcus had both cocaine and marijuana in his system. The autopsy report also came back showing Marianne had not died from drowning but from strangulation. This really set the investigation off in a different direction. The autopsy showed that Marianne had two broken ribs, eye hemorrhaging, abrasions on her forehead, right cheek, lips, neck, back, and legs, in addition to arm injuries and bruising below the waist consistent with squeezing and grabbing. When confronted with the autopsy results, Marcus changed his story. In this new version, he claimed that Clark had drugged him and that he had passed out. He then asked asked for his attorney to be present while he made a statement. Not much later, he changed his mind about needing an attorney to be with him and asked to speak to investigators again. That time, he told them that he had actually spent 75 to 90 minutes in the woods looking for firewood. The police report did note that Marcus had briar marks and bug bites on his legs. Maybe he spent all that time looking for the magic hydrangea branches he thought would bring Marianne back to life and not firewood like he said. Really, he's just trying to cover all the time between Marianne being killed and the call to 911. It's truly disgusting. There was a court hearing held to determine if there was enough evidence to allow the case to proceed to a grand jury. At the hearing, investigators testified about what happened that night and about Marcus's past history with women. GBI Special Agent Michael Mabin took the stand to present evidence for the murder case against Marcus Lillard, the man accused of murdering Marion Shockley, a UGA professor. Mabin explained investigators conducted three interviews with Lillard, and he was inconsistent with his explanation of what happened. Just telling me what is, but that she, she the state argued that bruising and rib fractures found during autopsy support an aggravated assault charge and show she was strangled. Mabin also said several women claiming a romantic history with Lillard said he would choke them during sex. Describe uh, him being very, very rough, violent during sex. Um, Some reported they would even pass out. So according to this person, they're close friends and four other people were close. And he also told us that he knew of Lillard's habit of choking women during sex and has actually told him, you need to stop doing that or you're going to kill him. The case did go to a grand jury and eventually Marcus was indicted in January of 2020 and then again in March of 2021 when a second indictment was filed. The charge of concealing the death of another was dropped, but a new charge of aggravated assault was added. In court, Marcus's attorney argued that the murder charge should be dropped as well as the charge of aggravated assault. He said that her death was accidental and that the choking had been consensual. I'm pretty much a live and let live kind of a person and whatever kinks you have, hey, 
wait, go ahead and enjoy them so long as they aren't hurting other people. In the case of erotic choking, there's a really fine line between fun and, well, death and murder charges. A judge did allow the case to move forward. I couldn't find anywhere of a trial date having been set, but I'm wondering if and when it happens, if Marcus will move back to the narrative that he was drugged. The tea Marcus says Clark brewed contained DMT, which is an hallucinogenic drug. Is it possible that Marcus by himself or Marcus and Clark or even all three of them took the drug earlier in the evening? DMT can produce very intense experiences, including visual hallucinations, depersonalization, auditory distortions, as well as an altered sense of time. Other effects include agitation, and although most things say that the odds of it making you violent are very, very low, when combined with other drugs, it becomes harder to predict what all the effects will be. Being in an altered state makes some of the things reported to have happened that night make a little more sense. The wide range of times. I was in the woods 15 minutes. No, it was 75 minutes. No, it was 90 minutes. Or we tried to revive Marianne for a few minutes when it was really two hours. Was Marcus so drugged that he had lost his sense of time? Who knows? What I do know is that drug use can't ever excuse a woman dying. As much as there are parts of this story that are so bizarre and ridiculous, you almost start to laugh. The sad truth is that two people died that night. A friend described Clark as generous, just constantly always saying yes. He was always there for you. He was also an incredibly smart person. If I could talk to him, I would just want to echo my appreciation for him and what he did for me and so many others. I just want others to look at him as a beacon for how to love other people. Before taking his life, Clark did write a note in which he said that he didn't know what happened to Marianne, but that he couldn't live knowing she had died on his watch. Marianne left behind a son and a daughter, as well as many friends and former students who loved her. Marianne Shockley was a mother and a friend to many people, but during her time at the University of Georgia, she impacted the lives of hundreds, maybe thousands of students. It was by far the most personable professor I ever had. She just had a passion for teaching. She was able to take kids who, you know, normally wouldn't care about bugs or insects and didn't really care to be around them whatsoever, but made them passionate about them and how they affected our daily lives. Trip Arrowwood is a former student so of Shockley's and a founding member of the club she ran, the UGA Bug Dogs. She was so good about engaging her students. According to her LinkedIn page, Shockley taught at UGA for 17 years after also earning her master's and doctorate degrees in entomology in Athens. UGA spokesman Greg Trevor sent WMAZ a statement that read in part, on behalf of the university, I'd like to express our deepest sympathy to the family, students, and colleagues colleagues of Dr. Mary Ann Shockley. I've never met anyone that had one bad thing to say about her. Students say Shockley also ran a summer bug camp for Athens area kids and had two kids of her own who learned of her passing on Mother's Day. I can't put into words how much she'll be missed. Georgia and the community will be a little less joyful without her. So that's the scareful story of one hot tub, one murdered professor, and two naked men. What do you think happened that night? Let me know in the comments down below. And until next time, stay safe, stay off drugs, stay out of hot tubs, and stay careful.